This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. For more than 200 years, Wall Street has repeatedly caused financial panics. The American economy has repeatedly plunged into recession or depression. And each of these collapses has met with outraged protest, particularly in Wall Street's home, New York. In 1792, 1837, 1857, 1874, and 1930, citizens marched on and occupied Wall Street. Today's Occupy Wall Street is the latest of such popular reactions to economic dereliction and dislocation. Here to talk about Occupy Wall Street and its historical antecedents is Mike Wallace, distinguished professor of history at CUNY's John Jay College and co-author of the magisterial Pulitzer Prize winning Gotham, A History of New York to 1898. His other books include A New Deal for New York and Mickey Mouse History and other essays on American memory. Mike is a public historian and he's worked with museums, filmmakers, radio producers, and novelists, and was a consultant and talking head on Rick Burns' eight-part PBS special, New York, a documentary film. He has recently written a series of essays, mini essays, be before Occupy Wall Street, notes on prior New York City protests against economic crises. Welcome, Mike. Welcome to me, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan. Let's start talking about this series of mini um, uh, essays. You talk about five major events mm -hmm. and the protests that surrounded us, antecedents to this. Can you give us a, a thumbnail of each of these and what themes come out of them? Well, I mean, one, one question that uh, gets asked is, uh, uh, does history repeat itself? Uh, and, you know, no, it doesn't. But there are patterns in history. And in the case of a capitalist economy, you stay with the same rules of the game, you get the same outcomes very often. So there are remarkable similarities between these things from the late 18th century down through the mid 20th century. But also, they have to be taken on their own terms. And one of the things that interests me is the degree to which uh, um, uh, the larger notions of what is just and what is unjust at a particular historical moment, uh, and there are contending uh, uh, battles over sure. those definitions, uh, uh, have in fact manifested themselves in, in protests or not. So in 1792, long story. And this is before the, there's a stock exchange. There's no stock exchange, uh, but there's stock. OK, uh, go it's ahead. It's a complicated story, and it's, you know, I spell out the details in, in, this, uh, in this little piece. And in the, and, and and the large in, Gotham. And in Gotham itself, Ted and I go on about this at, at length. Um, uh, there's a guy named uh, Dewar, who's like the Darth Vader of early American <laughs> finance, who, with this early informal stock market, booms stocks up artificially. Uh, a lot of people can run in and buy stocks, see the plug gets pulled, and, you know, down tumbles everybody. Dewar, in those days, in fact, is arrested and thrown in jail in debtor's prison. We don't do this anymore, although it's conceivable we, that it's we might We, we might con consider uh, it. Yeah, for a minimum, if, you, if you're in debt for over a million, let's say. No, you know. if you earn more than that, it's the ah, reverse. That's, that's another story. That's a different kind that's of prison. That's another story. Uh, and so, in fact, crowds form outside the jail, and they want to come in and string this guy up or disembowel him. Uh, in a sense, this is from the era of the American Revolution, when crowds took to the streets mm -hmm. routinely to enforce what were generally considered to be the rules of the moral economic game. People didn't do certain kinds of things, and he had done them, and therefore, you know, protest was following. Yeah, yeah there's an element of mobocracy about Correct. a lot of New York City politics. Well, yes, well, in, certainly in, in, in the earlier days. Right. In, in to, to jump down to 1857, uh, much bigger because the economy is not much more organized around uh, the stock exchange and like, uh, and there's a crisis. Um, and uh, uh, German socialists, in this case, take the lead in mobilizing protests against this. And they march on Wall Street, literally, thousands strong. 
and talking about sort of vague demands, they had one demand, we want work. Uh, and what they wanted was the city, in fact, to respond with some public works program, mm -hmm. which, in fact, they did. It's called Central Park. Uh, it had been stymied, but, in fact, this motivated by these throngs of the streets, uh, they, in fact, came up with the money. Um, and that crash, like the earlier ones, was that produced both financial and real estate bubbles that burst. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it sound, there's a lot of eerie yeah, familiarities yeah, and the, eternal verities the, here. The, the, the parallels between them are most remarkable in the workings of the economy and nature of the collapse. So, I mean, just to jump down to 1929, uh, again, you know, what you often get in this economy is uh, a period of boom. You know, and then a period of bust. Boom, bust, boom, bust. So it looks like a sine curve. Um, uh, and usually those booms are, for a while, productive. They're based on sales of real things to real people. By the end of a certain point, profit margins begin to shrink. Money shifts into speculation in real estate or into stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, the bubble is blown, and then, uh, and then we have uh, catastrophe, homelessness, and so forth, and protests. So, but in, by the 1930s, the protests are bigger, they're more organized. The mm -hmm. communists, in fact, in this case, are involved. Very and interesting. In 1930s, and their demonstration, in fact, leads the city to come up with the first serious chunk of change to spend on public works programs. And then it goes up to the state level, and then eventually it goes up to the federal level. So arguably, these protests in the street uh, are one of the big galvanizing forces that leads to the New Deal. I mean, they were very clear at the top that one of the reasons we have to take these radical public intervention measures is because the alternative could be, you know, revolution. Disorder uh, of the uh, dangerous disorder. classes. Exactly. So you argue that there are no lessons to be learned here, that each response was specific. But what, what are the patterns and what... And then you've been downtown, you've been yeah, to yeah. Occupy Wall Street, yeah. and you've heard and listened to the commentary. Right. What are... What are the, the patterns here? What are the similarities? And what can we learn other than the facts of the past? Well, I think one of the things uh, that has happened is uh, that uh, Occupy Wall Street has resurrected a sense of injustice. I mean, again, one of the things that varies in different periods of crisis and different kinds of response and resistance it depends on what you think you're up against. So if, in fact, you're in a depression, and personally, you believe, because this is the way they taught you in school, uh, well, if you're unemployed, it's your fault. You don't have the moral stamina and the wherewithal, you know? People who succeed deserve their money because, in fact, they're superior beings. And you're saying this is not if true? If you believe no, that, no, okay. no, 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 but if you no, believe that, your response is, oh, me, you know, and you get depressed, depression, depression. Right. If, in fact, you believe that, no, 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 this is an epiphenomena of the structure of the way we organize Systemic. our economic life, yeah. you say, it ain't me, babe, uh, and I'm ticked off, and this is wrong, and, in fact, it empowers you. So to the degree that you mm. understand the nature of what you're up against, um, uh, it's a very important fact to determining how, in fact, the response plays out. But there's also this question of justice or not. I mean, when they went after Dewar, he was a violator of community mores. Uh, in 1857, uh, uh, they were saying, literally, some Irish radical newspapers were saying, uh, uh, you know, you're telling us you can't do this, you can't intervene, you can't provide jobs because it's against the laws of economics and, and, uh, and Adam Smith. And they say, we don't want to hear about this old fogey, you know, political economic stuff. They had a, a counter analysis, so it gave them muscle. But we've lived in an era since at least the 70s and 80s when given the push from the right, which has many dimensions to it, one of them is in fact that it pushed off the boards any sense that it was even possible to be immoral, the workings of the economy. Mm. Uh, uh, it's just the way it was. One of my favorite or most outrageous examples of this was the abolition of usury. I mean, it's not just that they made it legal to charge whatever the hell interest rate you feel like charging. It was that the very concept that this could be considered immoral to have a 38% rate of interest, what are you talking about? Anything that the market bears, this is an efficient response to buy, to supply and demand. You don't have a purchase point. You don't have a moral ground to stand on, to contest this. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have an analysis and you don't have a, a moral uh, uh, groundwork, you're, you're disarmed. 
morally and ideologically. What these people have done down there, among other things, is to restore the notion that this can be an unjust state of affairs. Mm. And if you don't have that, and the passion and the anger that flow out of a sense that injustice is being done, if you just have a 16-point plan, um, you're lacking the most important thing. Sure. And the other thing they've done is, in fact, the voice. The voice has returned. And until very recently, the political spectrum was a matter of running from Obama slash Geithner on the left, supposedly, to uh, the Tea Party on the right, and who could cut more and trim and so forth. And you knew that, in fact, there were God knows how many people who didn't think that, but they were completely frozen out of the media and the political conversation. When I, I got the call to go to the Foley Square demonstration, when the unions got together with sure. the WS, and I thought, oh, God, this is going to be really depressing. I mean, the unions can't even get Labor Day together, much less, uh, you know, Ooh. something. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm pro and all that, but it has been a dispiriting decade or two. Um, so I was going to just stop by quickly before I went to class. Uh, and I, so I came late. And I walked out of the Foley Square subway station right at, next to the speaker stand. You know, and I look up at this. And then I look out there. As far as the eye can see, throngs of people, all sizes, ages, descriptions, signs which were hilarious and cutting and powerful. Uh, and then, you know, the crowd sort of moves out. Horsemen ride up on police like they did in 1874 mm. in Thompson Square. Only there, they clubbed them into well, submission. Square was it? it was a disaster. But police in fact, riot. you clearly saw huddled white shirts. Are we going to try to stop this? No, we don't think that's a good idea. And then off its back goes down the street. And I thought, God, this could be a, a game changer. Next day, Obama's on the horn. You know, about, and then of course, the day after that, he waffled. Um, but to the degree that they have restored this, I hate to say silent majority, but I think it's very definitely true, they have done us a tremendous uh, service. Do you, do you sense a resonating out there? Is there, is this a sort of an, a more isolated, even though the phenomenon might be isolated, the voice is isolated. Is it is it is it pen, is it penetrating Dubuque, Iowa? Is it penetrating Youngstown, it's Ohio? It's all over the bloody is place. But I mean, it's also going Norman, to Oklahoma. higher levels. I must say, the Oakland thing was perfectly astonishing. When the cops come in and trash the place and you know knock people on the head and all that, I thought, oh, oh 1874 Tompkins Square, uh, they're going to be beaten. They shut down the port, a general strike. Who's, who's even imagined the concept of going on a general strike? Uh, it's breathtaking. Uh, and it's not just here. It's all over the bloody planet. So this is a movement that has staying power. Is it a movement? And we don't know. OK. We don't know. It's, it just, what is it's it, too to say. Well, What is it? You could argue that Perhaps at its best, if it's not merged with the analysis and the more precise, you know, which it hasn't done well, yet. Well, I'll come back to that. I'm, Go ahead. I, I think that's been been overdone. You could think of it as a revival. You could think of it as a secular revival. You could think of it as a, you know, th this is a country which specializes in being born again, and waves uh, of protests suddenly emerge out of nowhere. Remember, it wasn't the New Deal didn't come out of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, the New Deal, in fact, in tandem with what Roosevelt's initiatives were, exploded in the streets. The CIO, the immigrant organizations, and the rest of it. They pushed Roosevelt. Roosevelt, in fact, aided back. And, you and then this. there's a history going back to New York City and Tammany Hall Absolutely. and the politics of that, of that time. So there, there's, there's that, that to the degree that there is this passion and this moral rejiggering, uh, then that's a base uh, from which many things can follow. Now, in terms of programs, well, you know, in, this, in these mini essays at the end, I, I dropped in one thing that I took right. out of this little 10-year-old right. uh, uh, now New Deal for New York book, uh, which was calling for uh, what they then called a stock transfer tax, or now a financial transaction right. tax. You know, to the degree that people say, we don't know what their demands are, they're being disingenuous. I mean, you know, just look at the signs. Tax the rich. Now, that's not a very sophisticated, but it gets straight smack to a demand. 
So what you might think about doing is attaching that, so you can, I can imagine this on a screen somewhere or in reality, you, you attach a sign, uh, this is the tax the rich basket. So give me some notions. Uh, so this one is this tax on uh, stock, on transfers. stock transfers, which in fact was in effect in the United States, sure. often in the and in New York War, City, and, sure. and in New York City, sure. until extremely recently. And in fact, I haven't looked recently, but when I did this, uh, uh, this little book, the tax was left in place still, even after, in, during the fiscal crisis, the bankers managed to finally, you know, get it. it repealed. But it was left on the boards so that the taxes taken and then instantly rebated because they needed it for some complicated, you know, cover. Um, it, it then brought in about seven billion dollars, which was at the time five billion dollars was our fiscal crisis deficit would have been solved you know, overnight. Now, there's a nice piece by um, the National Employment Lawyers Project, NELP, anyway, N-E-L-P, uh, uh, .org, and they've just come out with a thing oh, yes. which ha has a whole list of taxes, tax on you know, change, capital gains tax at, at a higher rate, tax the top millionaires, uh, corporate income tax up one percent, whatever. A whole basket of very specific taxes which add up to six hundred and eighty one billion dollars. It ain't gonna happen. Well, that depends. To the degree that this force, you know, becomes vocal, passionate, angry, um, in the current political environment of the, of this political team. environments can change with breathtaking speed. It's like what the media does. The media didn't see this. It just was invisible yep. or snotty, you know. And I I, was, I read the first things on this, and I said two things. One, oh, the Times. The Times is you know, but he's screwing this up. Uh, and they just might get a serious comeuppance this time. And of course they do. And when in fact things turn around, it's like suddenly the Klieg lights come on. And the cameras are all over the place, and suddenly it's a media event, and it's real. And, and the tab, way, but the tab, no. the tabs are all over at the post. They have monsters, they're slobs, they have wastrels. That's fine. That's but they, fine. But, it means that they have bites. It means that they have teeth. But and then I read these, these mini essays, and it's much the same argument. I mean, they, you've got the same types of responses. You could almost get the bumper stickers on either <laughs> side <laughs> in 1874. Yes, you could. But also, you look at those. Those, those particular demonstrations, and in fact, in except for 1874, when there was just a defeat, uh, they got stuff. They got Central Park. They got you know the waterworks system. They got you know by extension, eventually the New Deal. Right. Uh, so, and nobody saw that coming. Not at the beginning. So we need an historian's pers time perspective to, to appreciate what it's might happen. Special pleading, but, but go uh, ahead. But it's I think so. Well, you know, honestly, I mean, uh, this is not to blow one's horn because, in fact, it's pretty obvious. Uh, I've predicted the current crisis in public places. You know, I've, several I've, years. I, I can vouch for before this. this. Uh, and why? Well, because I I saw it coming back in the '90s as they began dismantling gingerly this and that regulatory thing and then build up to uh, dismantling altogether Glass-Steagall. And then they invented, even when I wasn't looking barely, they invented hedge funds, which were completely outside any regulatory system. And now you have this giant cloud of capital circling the planet, oh, God. swooping down oh, on this is Why, wait a minute. This and is then pulling out again and leaving ruin and... And I thought, and, oh my and, God, remember, this is a cartoon, Norb. This remember is remember '99. I mean, the Russian crisis. And all, they kept thinking, "Oop, it's going to crack. It's going," but then it didn't. So they said, "Screw it," because they forget. I, I, I was asked somewhat bizarrely by Goldman Sachs to come and give a lecture to them right in the middle of the crisis. Actually, half of them had to leave because they were going down to Washington because the big uh, insurance AIG thing had just broken. But top management uh, and the uh, top economists, they wanted, me to know, they wanted to know about New York City and past historical crises. So I did more or less the stuff that's in these mini essays. Mm -hmm. And after each one, I would stop and I'd say, how many people know about this? 
Nope, nope. All right, well, we're going to go to the next one. But do they recognize they, it? They, they, they may even... not know it. Did they recognize it at all? Of course, that, that was what the, they were fascinated. I said, listen, I'm prepared to stop in any minute, and we'll just have a general sure. discussion. Uh, you want me to go on to the next one? Or so? Yeah, yeah, let's hear the next one. Because the mechanics of it were so familiar to them. As, you yeah. know, as, as people who play sure. this game, they could recognize instantly, and the consequences they were less clear on. Although there was one, uh, one uh, very nice woman, an economist, who said... When I was talking about in the 1920s, this catastrophe, Goldman Sachs has this Teflon wonderful reputation now, but they really screwed up big time in the 20s. And this guy who was in charge, Wadil Catchings. Uh, so I quickly went through that. Most of them didn't know about that either, their own firm. Uh, but this one woman, a uh, uh, senior person, said, I want you to know that in the boardroom where we have oil paintings of all the former chairs, there is no oil painting of Wadil Catchings. <laughs> So, you know, there's, oh, got his there's, some, there's some memory. So, uh, yeah, you could, you could see this coming if you have a historical sense. doesn't mean you know when it's going to happen. If you did, you could make a fortune on this. Okay, now, now let's sort of make the transition, yeah. book and, and, and article-wise. Yeah. You talk about memory. Mm -hmm. Your book, Mickey Mouse History and Other Essays on American Memory, you argue that American society in particular has a real memory problem. We don't remember. Now, is it willful forgetness uh, or just well, bad memory? This is always a tricky question. Do we not remember things because it's inconvenient for us to remember them? I mean, the Columbus myth, you know, this wild fact fantasy that Washington Irving, in essence, constructed, uh, that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Isabella hocked her jewels, and the last act is they arrive with the cross on, the, and then the second voyage, where he rounds people up, puts them in concentration camps, takes them back to Spain, sells them in the slave market. Not there. We know about this. Well, well that's your it's, historian's it's fault. Readily, you've, got, you've got to nonsense, correct that. Nonsense. It was perfectly available. But the grip, the tenacity okay. of this mythology is such that except for the, the Queen Centennial, where there was so much stuff, and from people who were affected in the rest right. of the world, that there was some rethinking, but it, but it didn't last. But I, I, I look in this little book at the, the political contests over the interpretation of history, because there is no history. There are a variety of perspectives that can be brought to bear. So, uh, and power, in fact, can be brought to bear. Uh, so... Uh, the Enola Gay story, for instance, at the Smithsonian, a famous mid -90s. Uh, battle, mid-90s, when um, there was a perfectly respectable uh, uh, show that was proposed that the Smithsonian was going to do. It was ahead, a chunk of the Enola Gay, and, among other things, it, how could one not uh, talk about the bombing and the political context in which it happened and the debates over it and the various people from Eisenhower, et cetera, sure. et cetera, who you know, had reservations. Uh, but it was, you know, it was measured and all the rest of it. Well, uh, this storm arose in the media, um, and uh, uh, this is outrageous. This is, you know, lefty claptrap, uh, and it should be it should be banned. So I, I went down to the Smithsonian to talk to these beleaguered curators, and I I, I wanted to find out who was who was pushing uh, to to axe this thing, and there was an organization that built itself as a veterans organization uh, uh, called the Air Force Association. So I, I had a look at, at the Air Force Association, and, and I, I looked at its magazine, and I compared its magazine to the American Legion magazine. The American, not, the, not the content, the ads. Mm -hmm. And I went to the ads in the American Legion magazine, and they were for wheelchairs and, you know, back pain medicine and, and canes and whatnot. I went to the Air Force magazine, and it was big, glossy spreads for the F-4 Starfighter, cheap at $20 million. I said... We're not talking veterans organization. I poked around some more. This was a lobby that was set up by Hap Arnold back, you know, after the Second World War to lobby Congress for, you know, next year's uh, budget. And they were bringing resources and money, in fact, to sort of, because if you have in the central cathedral of memory in the Smithsonian itself, if you have something that tarnishes in any way retrospectively the Air Force, this is not good for business. Uh, and they were able to get it killed. Wow. Wow. I mean, the show went on, but stripped of any questions about what the airplane did. It was just, this is an airplane. Um. So, I mean, one of the, one of the, 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 the wonderful things about the illustrations that, and examples you use in the book is the contested nature of history and how history is sold as sort of a, a society control device, if you will. So, again, 
Mickey Mouse history. Before we go, we got to talk about Gotham. Talk to me. So you talk talked you. about, you know, the this magisterial history, which goes from the beginning to the, the consolidation of 1898. 18, 1898 with uh, Edwin Burroughs. Now you're doing 98 to, to the, the Second World to War. the end of the Second World this War. This took you 20 That's, years. How yeah. long have you been working so on So far, two? 11. I, I have Are high hopes of coming in under time budget. Uh, and the time budget is 20 years. No, 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 mm. no, no. I think a couple of more years. I'm, I'm, in fact, through to the end of the Second War. But because this preposterous enterprise stretches over such a long period of time. You got to go back. Material back in the beginning it was written 15 years ago. Good, so then you got to update. You got to update. So worst case scenario, I get to the end and I have to update all over again. So I'm hoping not to get caught on an endless treadmill. So far, what has been the event character that sort of intrigued you the most and said, wow, and caused you to, you know, digress on another track yeah. for a while? Well, you know. One. It, the the one thing uh, is is this massive constellation of things, and it's called the Second World War. The Second World War is, was nearly the Sargasso Sea of this enterprise. Ooh. I sailed into this thing, and I thought I just might never come out. It's so fascinating. It's so critical in innumerable ways, which we don't have time for. But one of the most fascinating things is the degree to which the flight from Europe of intellectuals, of artists, uh, of, of physicists, right. uh, of academics and whatnot. Some people call it the greatest you know, transfer of intellectual capital since the fall of the Byz Byzantium. Right. Uh, and so I look at how this plays out. In fact, in physics, Fermi meets Isidore, you know, Rabbi at Columbia. I look at how it plays out in, in modern art. Uh, 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 um, oh, you could get lost on this for the Jackson rest of your Paul. life. Several I, I lives. Could, I could, I could. But one of the things that was that I knew the least about was that the roots of what we've been talking about here, the right wing sort of attempt to redefine uh, all these things, is New York in the post-war when von Mises, the ultimate Austrian economic school you know, god, uh, meets Anne Rand uh, in New York City. And to some extent, out of this you know, coming together, uh, the modern uh, right wing movement uh, is born. Oh, we have to stop, but you have to come back. <laughs> I would be delighted to. Always a pleasure. Thank you. My thanks to Mike Wallace for being on the show. For more information about the Gotham Center, go to GothamCenterOneWord.org. Next week, we'll talk with Vin Cipolla, president of the Municipal Arts Society. Join us here on CUNY TV. Excellent, Mike. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.